Hello everyone. I'm glad to see you on my channel. The story I'm going to tell you today is pure. It is true that all the bad things that happen in life happen for a reason. It is said that we can appreciate the good things, the things when they happen to us. I hope you enjoy this story. I wish you a pleasant viewing experience. It seemed to Leo that the whole world was an ocean and people were like sea creatures. The most beautiful and brightest fish are in view. Politicians, stars, and celebrities. Crabs swarm on the seashore. What not builders, what not traders? The water surface is cut now, and then by the fins of sharks, which remind Leo of businessmen. And where is his place in this ocean of life? At the bottom. That's where the most unpleasant creatures like him hide. Their faces wrinkled, their bodies unnatural. But once upon a time long ago, Leo was a shark, a goldfish. At the very least, he could have been a crab, cowering on the shore. But fate dealt him a different card, and Leo became a drifter. These guys come in many forms. There are those who collect aluminum cans from morning till night, doing the cheapest jobs. Others find a beggarly profession. They become street artists, luggage porters at train stations, cleaners in supermarkets. The most successful can even grab a bed in a room, but even with it you remain a beggar. Only now you worry not only about food and drink, but also about rent. And once you're behind on your rent, you're welcome to the streets. Leo was a vagrant of the lowest caste, from the very bottom. He baked in the crosswalks and at the train station, begging for change, which was barely enough for the cheapest food and drink. His comrades in misfortune called him Prince. Why? Only theorists talk about the bottom of life and rising from it. They look for reasons why people lose everything, even their own names and surnames, suggesting paths that resemble higher mathematics in their level of complexity. But Leo was a practitioner. He knew there was no bottom. You can always go a little lower. After the luxurious mansion of his parents, the brothels were all the vices of society thrive. After successful studies at an expensive university, it was to beg for change from passersby. He didn't go down that road quickly. No, contrary to all the arguments of theorists, in practice falling into the abyss resembles climbing a mountain. Not everyone reaches the top. Not everyone falls to the bottom. There were many stairs between the mansion with the heated pool and the basement lodge. Friends' apartments, bunk beds in hostels, bunks in social sleepovers, between the promising life of a future financier and a coin mug, deceptions, betrayal, and judgment. But it's all in the past. If you look at your past life from the bottom, it's covered by a column of murky water. Leo no longer looked to the past or the future. The planning horizon had shrunk to one day today. Not so bad, if you thought about it. He consoled himself with the thought that it could have been worse. Became a junkie like Pete, or froze his foot off like Joe. As it was, he was just an alcoholic, could walk on his own and even climb into deep basements. That's because he played sports in college. So the planning horizon and today, not such a bad day really. Today, Leo managed to scrounge up $4.92. Not enough for a bed in the lodge. We'll have to sleep in the basement, but a loaf of bread, a bottle of port, and a candy bar would do. Leo was too relaxed to move towards the beggar's store. He was already anticipating how he would open the port wine, how he would take the first sip. He counted in his mind that instead of a chocolate bar, he could buy the cheapest hot sausage or hamburger. How, after getting drunk, he would cozy up on the cardboard and dream about his past life. And then, all of a sudden, out of the blue. Hey, Prince, a familiar voice called out to him. Come here. Well, I'm waiting. Oh no. He was too relaxed today and forgot about Theo. He's always avoiding this place. This territory where he's been zeroed in on so many times. Yeah, beggars have their own boundaries and domains. This place was ruled by a former boxer and street hooligan whose real name nobody knew. Everyone called him by his nickname in the ring, the Torador or Theo. He's able to shake money from all the underprivileged and also from children, but not the ones who'd run to their parents to complain. Boxer somehow knows how to tell them apart. He's afraid of normal people, but not of lowlights like Leo. What did you scrape up, huh? Theo asked lazily. Leo had tried to challenge him for leadership once before and had gotten a very painful blow in the ear. He hadn't heard from him for a month. Now he tried to be polite to his tormentor. Theo, please. I feel so bad. Leo asked. I need a bottle badly. I'm dying. 
Who's having a good time? The ex-boxer asked. You think I like here? Vetting guys like you? I'd like to be in the ring. Footlights, a model with the round number. You ain't never been in a gym like this, have you? Where I boxed? Well, what have you got? Show me. Leo remembered betting a thousand dollars on some boxer. What was his name? Tyler or Bronson? And he lost that time in a past life. And he wasn't even a little bit upset because his father had money in the bank. And now he's shaking on a low five. Theo took everything but a dollar. Here, Prince, said the boxer with a smile, a few of his front teeth missing. Go on and don't deny yourself anything. Leo sighed and wandered back. We'd have to stand in the crosswalk some more and some more, but it's good in the mornings, and then in the evening rush hour when everyone comes home from work. Nine o'clock is dead time, for some innocent question about a couple of coins you can get a punch in the forehead. Leo fixed his beard, smoothed his greasy hair. And then he saw her. No, it couldn't have been him. Just in case, the beggar left his passage and went to the next one. Leo felt his pulse quicken and his heart began to pound hard. She. No, it couldn't be. Nick was working in the next crosswalk. He probably already left, so he wouldn't mind. And there's a coffee machine. What do we got here? Check the change compartment. Ten cents. That's not bad. Nick was really nowhere to be found. So by the unwritten rules of beggars, he might as well take his place temporarily. To get a couple of dollars quickly, Leo decided to use a forbidden trick. He stood near the coffee machine and waited for someone to order a drink. Good evening, he said to the man who had just thrown a $10 bill into the machine and pressed the lotta button. I'm embarrassed to be addressing you, but go to hell, the stranger replied, shoveling change out of the change tray. What, what, what? Leo made a puzzled grimace, but the man didn't seem to be in a lyrical mood. You must have misunderstood me. Go, I said, he said, you stink like the devil himself. Why did you come to me in the first place? I thought I was going to talk to a human being, and here. Then there was a little blackout. The stranger must have had enough and hit Leo. And it must have hit him in the solar plexus, because it was like the lights went out. The next moment, when the tramp came to his senses, he had a bill in his hand. Ten dollars. Leo from surprise almost fainted again. A whole ten dollars. Enough for the night's lodging and the port. He wasn't hungry anymore. He nimbly tucked the bill into his sock and walked down neutral streets, where no one would claim his earnings. He walked up to his favorite little bed and breakfast with a shower, the best combination of price and quality, and the Castellan was clearly breathing heavily in his direction. But she'd probably send him to the showers now since he hadn't been here in a month, if not two. When was the last time he stood under the jets of water? Now he'll wash up, trim his beard with a pair of scissors, trim his hairline a little, and run to the store. A convenience store, the kind where no one looks at your appearance. They'll have time to get drunk before 11 o'clock. Oh look, the lion cubs here, smiled the Castellan, revealing her missing teeth. Are you saving money, little one? Have you forgotten all about your mommy? Leo smiled and ignored her barb. It was better not to quarrel with that woman. After all, she was the only one who decided who would sleep in the bunk tonight and who would sleep outside. He slipped the Castellan a $10 bill, got $5 in change, and went to the tenth room. All the seats on the first tier were already taken. It was no trouble, he could go up to the second tier. Putting down the bag with his belongings, Leo rushed into the common bathroom, free. Unlike dozens and hundreds of his fellows, he couldn't get used to the lack of hygiene. Every night, he could feel with his skin the urge to take a shower, and he suffered the most from it. Lathering his body with free soap, Leo literally got high, then looking in the mirror he tried to cut the unruly hairs from his face and head. It was even worse than it had been. But it's okay, they'll grow back in a couple days. After the shower, the dirty clothes didn't want to fit on my body, they stuck. The laundry room was already closed because the dryer drum was making too much noise. You have to come early to use it, you always feel better after a bath. Even a wimp like Leo felt better. He looked at himself in the mirror, he looked almost young. How old is he? Leo tried to count in his mind. I think it was 33 or 34. And here he was already at the bottom. Leo remembered the starting point where it all began and sighed bitterly. The Castellan, who was clearly sympathetic to him, had given him a traditional sandwich and a disposable toothbrush. It seemed to be her duty, but not all visitors got the bonus. 
and let's face it, most of them didn't even know how to brush. Leo ate a sandwich with a thin, thin layer of margarine and ham and brushed his teeth, noting the pain in several of them. I'll have to pull them out, he thought, or suffer through it. There was a note in the bag. He knew at once that the Castellan had written it. She wanted to meet him. There was no point in upsetting his aunt, but he wasn't going to reciprocate. Who did she think she was, after all? So he put the note in his pocket without unfolding it. He returned to the common room, climbed to the second tier, realized that he had forgotten to run for port wine. He closed his eyes and fell asleep, and in the lingering, restless slumber I saw her. The very day after which everything went wrong. The very minute after which he had descended or climbed to the bottom. And cried in his sleep and screamed, and the rest of the temporary roommates flinched and looked at the noisy guests with displeasure. In the morning Leo woke up and remembered the note that had been in the sandwich bag. Where had it gone? The idea of making the Castellan happy didn't seem quite so crazy anymore. The note was found, but with difficulty. When Leo unfolded it and read it, his hair stood on end. Was it really her? Candy was over the moon. Love, true love. It was exactly what she used to read about in books and watch in movies growing up in her parents' home. There, in her native village, there was all nature, forest, river, horses. But she, like her sister, was always drawn to the city. It seemed to her that here she will quickly find happiness, and people will be friendly and kind to her. Alas, the city is 50% made up of nay fools like her. Just when Kendi was about to despair, he and his love appeared. To think that something like that could happen in real life. That's why she was over the moon, and still two months pregnant. It's just a pity that Leonard was in no hurry to bring clarity to their relationship. His face was as impenetrable as his father's. Candy thought he took the news of the pregnancy coolly. He even asked her to show him the test. But that didn't mean anything. Obviously, everyone takes the news of impending parenthood differently. But yesterday, I think it all became clear. Leonard took her to the lakeside, the most romantic place this side of the ocean. It'll be our secret, baby girl, he said, smiling for the first time in a long time. Leave your girlfriend a note saying you're leaving. I'll be waiting for you at our secret spot and be sure to bring your suitcase. The place, however, was known to all the couples who preferred to seclude themselves in cars in this part of town. By a strange coincidence, her room was nearby. Candy couldn't afford a spacious apartment, but she didn't want to live on campus either. They'd be married soon, and they'd be sure to get a bigger place. She never told him anything about her sister. He thinks she's living with her girlfriend. Where are you going? Cindy asked. A secret, smiled Candy. Even though her sister is two years younger, Kendi and Cindy looked like twins. They were often confused at school, though if you look closely, there were clearly more differences than similarities. Cindy is a little taller and Kendi is a little shorter, a couple of centimeters. The younger sister loved dramas and the older sister loved detectives. Kendi went to law school and Cindy went to design school. But the sisters loved each other and never fought. In a big ruthless city, they could only count on themselves and each other. Where are you going, you little thing? Cindy wouldn't stop. Shut up, you little bub, laughed Candy. They often made up hurtful nicknames for each other. He said it should be our secret. Uh-huh, replied the younger one. Did the big boy have a conscience? Decided to take him somewhere beyond the parking lot for once. You don't understand anything. I told you, Candy said sharply. He's gonna propose. He will. God willing, Cindy replied. She was worried about her sister. After talking to the younger one, Candy was beginning to feel afraid too. She had convinced her so much that Leonard didn't really love her that she had doubts. Luckily, he would show up and all fears would immediately fade away. They drove to their secret place and there, Sydney did not yet know that her sister was in an interesting position. Leonard had forbidden her to tell anyone. He's very superstitious. You'll be dancing at my wedding, whispered Candy, you'll see. Oh, sister, answered Cindy. They had nowhere to hide from each other in the small room. The only thing that helped was the common terrace, where they could go out and get some air. The enterprising owners divided the rooms with partitions and rented their small house to ten guests at once. At first it was not easy for the girl to share the territory with so many people. There were only two bathrooms and one kitchen for such a crowd. Squabbling, crowding, constant noise all the charms of life in a huge city, but it's cheap. Leonard showed her another world another universe. 
Everything was different on the planet of luxury and wealth. Huge houses with swooning pools and saunas, fancy cars, expensive suits and ties. They met by chance. In order to simplify the life of her father and mother, Kindy got a job in a bar for the rich to sell flowers to drunken guests at night. The first time they met, Leonard bought a whole basket of them. I would like to take to these luxurious flowers their charming salesman, he smiled. The young man, whom the sister scornfully called a major, drove her out of town in his luxurious Cadillac. He spoke beautiful words, praised her perfect figure, and then, then she was a little ashamed. But Leonard said it was normal, and some people were literally made for each other. Since then, he'd come to see her a couple times a week, taking her to that secret spot. Then he'd drive her back, and at her request, drop her off about 200 meters from her house. She thought it was a relationship. You're a fool, the younger one said, but Kendi wouldn't listen to her. In the morning, when her sister was still asleep, the girl took her suitcase and carefully walked out the door. The whole big house was resting, so there was an unaccustomed silence in the rooms. No one was to see her leave this place, forever. Kindy had been lucky, no one else from her town, which for some reason was called the village, and ever won a law school grant. In class, the children of rich and successful parents, of course, teased her about her accent, her cheap clothes. But Leonard balanced it all out, and when she found out she was going to have a baby, she was scared at first. First of all, college. But you can take a sabbatical for at least a year. She's in good standing, she's bound to get favorable treatment. Secondly, finances. But Leonard's parents have a lot of money, they should be able to make it work. Thirdly, she was just scared. Although it was only the tenth week of pregnancy, her body had already begun to metamorphose. What would happen next? Good morning, baby. He smiled and opened the trunk with a button. Loaded in there. Little things like that, of course, annoyed Kindy. She had to put the suitcase in the trunk herself. Good thing it was light. Lito never opened the door for her, rarely hugged her in public, hardly ever gave her gifts. Once he brought her to his parents' house, a luxurious mansion. But he wouldn't even introduce her to mom or dad. On the contrary, he walked her through the back door like a spy. But love gave her the strength to forgive. So what if they'd only known each other a few months? Yes, he's arrogant, impulsive, but he's still her man. The drive to Lakeside wasn't a short one, and Kendi dozed off, stretching out in the back seat. She adored both Leonard and his Cadillac. They were both so easy and comfortable. Wake up, baby, her husband-to-be said. We're here. Cold enough as it was, today he outdid himself. Looking around, Leonard strode forward. He didn't even look in her direction. It was obvious he was worried. Lakeside was very quiet in the mornings. And at this time, not a soul at all. Of course he's going to propose. Candy reassured herself. It's not an easy step to take. It's understandable. Leonard climbed higher and higher to the cliff. From there, he had a magnificent view of the vast lake. Whether it was the pregnancy or the early awakening, the girl found it difficult to walk. Her man didn't even look back, and the gap between them grew wider and wider. She was treading on the polished stones of the path, and her strength to move on was diminishing. Would you help me? She finally asked, and felt a pang of guilt. She couldn't handle anything on her own. Oh, I'm sorry, he replied, and hurried back for Kendi. Leonard supported her, but in a detached way. Coldly, that's not how one holds a future wife, the girl thought. Is he really that worried? There was no one on the cliff at this early hour. The view was indeed breathtaking. A light haze was rising over the lake. Together, they walked to the very edge of the cliff. She looked thoughtfully into the distance and imagined herself as a bird flying over the water. I, he said, I don't even know what to say. Tell it like it is. Candy smiled without turning around. She looked ahead, admiring the scenery. Strong hands grabbed her shoulders and turned her around. The girl realized that he wanted to kiss her. In general, long conversations were not easy for him. But Leonard knew the language of love perfectly. Candy smiled though her man's grip on her seemed too strong. I want to memorize your eyes, he said. What? The girl wondered, and in the same second loving hands sharply pushed her away. She felt the ground go from under her feet, and from surprised, she couldn't even scream. Leo opened his eyes. Nightmares again. He saw her again. At times the vagabond completely forgot the green eyes and could live in peace. In the daylight, he rarely felt remorse. 
but at night, he was much more concerned about his ringing head. To think he hadn't had a drop of liquor last night, it felt like he'd been drinking half the night. Leo wanted to lie down for another half an hour. They would kick him out of the lodging house at 8 in the morning, and it was only 7. But something was keeping him from lying down. Something burrowed into his rib like a parasite. The vagrant scratched the spot lazily, and his hand came across a piece of paper. Exactly, the same note the Castellan had given him. Leo unfolded it, and the greasy hairs on his head stirred, miss me. The vagrant jumped down from the second tier and immediately began to gather up his unpretentious belongings. The fellow beggars grumbled unhappily. They hadn't paid five dollars each to be woken up by a hobo this early. But Leo did not listen to the disgruntled voices, he was possessed by an animal fear that drove him away. After years of vagrancy, no emotion lingers in the soul for long, and so his fear subsided when he reached the crossing of his hometown. The townspeople were in a hurry to get to work, which meant it was time for him to get to work too. He pulled a cup of coffee from the trash can, opened the lid, and drank the rest with relish. Then he reached out and started collecting coins. It's the Castellan playing around, Leo thought. What a naughty old thing. Certainly she was always paying him favors, and once she'd even given him an extra sandwich. She was very lucky. The woman had found this sweet position years ago. And before that, they say, also wandered. She's paid well, a hundred dollars a week, but she has to work 12 or 14 hours a day. Cleaning up after guys like him is not much of a job. No, Leo couldn't do it. He hated boring jobs that took up all his free time. Stock trading was his thing. It was his thing. It's a man's sport. But if you get hurt in the stock market, you're out of the field for the rest of your life, or in the ring for that matter. Good morning, miss, he said, nodding to his regulars. Thank you for the coin. Good day, sir. Thank you. Whenever there was a decent amount of money in the cup, it was supposed to be hidden. Leave a few coins so passersby could see you wasn't just standing there, you was working. Leo was so accustomed to sitting without a penny in his pocket that he didn't even immediately remember the five dollars left over from last night. Slapping himself on the forehead, he put the change in his pocket, threw the cup in the trash, and went to the cafe. He's not allowed in decent places. He goes to the beggar's canteen only when absolutely necessary. Not only do they feed him bread and margarine, but they make him recite prayers, and sing songs, and repent. And Leo hates admitting his own mistakes. Even though he wasn't allowed in the McDonald's lounge, he could go on McDrive if there were no cars. Eh, once upon a time he could pull it here in his own Cadillac. It was almost impossible to believe. Leo bought two hamburgers, fries, and a double Americano. It was almost six dollars, but it was worth it. Sitting down at the curb, on the curb, he enjoyed his meal. Eating, of course, was uncomfortable. He, as a visitor, had the right to sit at a table, to sit on a soft couch, most likely he had, but he didn't use it. After all, the staff could have called the cops, or the next time they wouldn't sell him anything at all. Leo quickly swallowed the buns and cutlets, and now sipped his coffee with pleasure. He took a sip and put the glass on the pavement. It had been a long time since he'd had that drink. Makes him feel better than booze. Leo was looking ahead when he heard a nasty but familiar sound. Someone had kicked the glass. The rest of the coffee spilled onto the pavement. Theo was standing next to him, grinning. Theo. Leonard was outraged. Why? Why? Theo looked surprised. Because I can, Prince. Get it? What are you doing here? You live for nothing? Leo almost cried in helplessness. Just think about it. Some city lunatic takes his honestly earned money, pours out his coffee and rubs his sides. The trap didn't want to put up with it, but he couldn't do anything about it either. Complain to the police. They wouldn't let him out of the station. Fight back. Why are you sitting there when I'm talking to you? Theo planted his foot on his chest and gave him a painful squeeze. Leo's breath caught. Sorry, he replied, rubbing the bruised area. I'm exhausted. So you're eating burgers without me. Theo continued and gave him a hard slap. I wish you'd offered. I haven't had a poppy seed since this morning. Leo jumped up from the blow, rubbing his cheek. They were standing near the roadway. Sure, you don't see cars around here that often. But by the unspoken rule of the beggars, this area was considered a no man's land, and anyone can come and sit in silence and solitude. Theo was breaking those rules and he knew it. Listen, boxer, began Leo, trying to speak conciliatory. I don't need any trouble. I'm going to leave now. 
I don't have any more money. I don't have any belongings either. You? Boxer grabbed him by the shoulders and set him down on the curb. He smirked. How much strength did he have left in him? When the tramp tried to get up, Theo prevented him from doing so. He'd slap his cheeks lightly, but hurtfully, and then he'd hit him on the head, then on the legs. Throw in Leo to the dead grass, and openly mocked him. Such behavior was frowned upon among beggars. They were the dregs of society, not teenagers. None of the vagabonds found out relationships just for the love of the art of conflict. Leo tried to crawl back, but Theo, with half a toothless grin, chased after him, stepped on his foot. And then, can I help you? He heard a woman's voice and turned around. The woman, one of those kind-hearted madams ready to separate vagrants, looked nothing like her. But for some reason it seemed otherwise to Leo. He jumped up and darted across the street, and just blew away Theo, who was trying to block his way. The former boxer flew a couple of meters to the center of the road and almost hit a rare car that passed here once an hour or less. Leo was running for his life, and somehow unknown to him he found himself back in his native passage. Here he felt at once calmer, as if he had returned to his own home. Even the townspeople looked at him with a little less contempt. Of course they did, because he was working here, not just hanging around. I think the lack of booze was starting to make him crazy. I should have bought a bottle of good old port instead of a double Americano. Besides, it's the same price. And now, because of his forced sobriety, Leo's head began to have bad thoughts. Yes, he did it 10 years ago or so. And now he's in agony, but you can't admit it to anyone, you have to deny it. Luke had spent more hours on the road than one could imagine. For some reason, no one in his neighborhood wanted to be a traffic cop. So he was always on duty, often without a partner. Other policemen without help is afraid even to go to the store, but Luke is not like that. But no one wants to mess with him. He's the biggest cop in the tourist part of town. And there's nothing going on here if you ask me. When Luke sees the dark red car, he turns on his blinkers. An expensive Cadillac with chrome hubcaps stopped. The driver's window rolled down. Is there a problem, officer? Leonard asked, smiling nonchalantly, though he was actually scared. Just an ID check, the patrolman replied. He hated big guys in expensive cars. To look at him, he wasn't even 25 yet. He never worked a day in his life, and the car cost as much as his house or even more. Luke quickly assessed the car. Rare, probably custom built. Leonard put his hands on the steering wheel not only because the radio had taught him to do so. He couldn't stop his fingers from trembling. So that the officer wouldn't see it, he squeezed the leather steering wheel. It was soothing, but not very soothing. After he'd gotten away unnoticed, it would be foolish to get caught by some thub. Insurance expired, sir, the cop said. I'd better get a new one. Thank you, Leo smiled. He didn't even want to explain that this car had a separate insurance policy, which was as thick as a book. Can I go now? Have a safe trip. The cop heard the walkie-talkie and immediately ran to the car. Something had happened on the lakeside again. He heard the investigation team and the rescue squad being called. It wasn't his department. He never understood how those smart guys investigated crimes. He was only interested in the chases. Adrenaline, tires squealing, driving on the edge. That was the life he liked. But crime, no, not that, no. It's better to stand on the road, all alone, even without a partner. And then years later, a smart guy poked Luke with a picture of a hobo. Tangled hair, hunted look. Apparently, it was taken by a homeless outreach service called The Way Back. Who needs the scum of the earth? Luke, who was in his final months of service before retirement, struggled to remember. But the further he got, the more he thought the smart guy in the white shirt was just messing with him. Do you recognize him? Well, ask it, officer, one of the ones Luke called jackets. They don't even wear real uniforms. You know, son, I'm sorry, the old cop said, making sure not to offend the smart guy. He looks like a regular hobo. I'll put five of these in a row for you. You wouldn't know the difference. Master Luke, think back. The officer wouldn't let it go. Red Jaguar. Verbendi leather interior. Very rare around here. Didn't this guy look like the driver? The old cop couldn't take it anymore and laughed. No, just think about it. This misunderstanding behind the wheel of a Yaga? Who would let him into the cabin of such an expensive car? The Burgundy leather, oh. In his thoughts, Luke stroked the noble surface. If a hobo like that got into a car like this, 
he'd spit him out like a fly. Son, said the traffic cop. I'll tell you like it is. Beggars don't drive cars. Not unless they steal one. And if a lump like that stole a Jaguar with a maroon interior, I'd kill myself to chase him down. And you would have found my report, son, even years later. All right, the smart guy wouldn't give up. How about this one? The investigator took out another photograph. It had a completely different face on it. Happy, smarmy. Girls like that. A yellow tie tied on a white shirt. And the smile. There's a hundred dollars invested in that smile. Has he ever seen one of these? Do you recognize this one? The investigator asked. Give it to me, Luke asked. He held the card up to his eyes. Red Jaguar, leather steering wheel. I think it was the day the girl was pulled from the bottom of the lake. The kind of pretty redneck he'd seen a picture of on the news later. But is it him? Or did he just look like a rich kid, the son of rich parents? And was there a Jaguar? Absolutely not. I'll tell you this, Luke sighed. Typical major. I've pulled them over a lot. Drunk, drunk, half dead. Maybe you got a picture of the car. The investigator crinkled his nose. Of course, there was no photo. After all, the traffic cops all look alike. Vagrants or rich guys. Cars are another matter. But he didn't have a picture of the Jaguar. The expensive car must have disappeared into a private collection and the new owner did not respond to the numerous requests of the police in the local newspapers, or just didn't read them. Bless you, Luke replied, rising from his chair and heading for the exit. He was angry that the smartest had made him come all this way, just for the sake of showing a picture of a hobo and a major. Investigator Mark sighed. It seemed he never solved this murder, and was there really a murder? It's convenient to have a body and a knife, or a body and a gun. Ideal when the perp tells someone about his exploits. Some guys kill someone, and soon the whole town knows who and when. What does he, Mark, have on this guy? Testimony from interested parties. Circumstantial evidence. The girl had at least a few reasons to kill herself. Stavro. But something kept Mark on his toes. Something that kept him going over and over again through the paperwork of the county's most notorious cold case. And it wasn't just that poor woman's restless sister, of course. No. Some inner feeling compelled him to leaf through the file again and again. A beggar's everyday life is like snowflakes or raindrops. The constant search for food and drink, running from the police, cheating social services. For some reason, everyone who does not live on the streets considers vagrants as violators and criminals. Not at all. There is much more grayness and humility among them than one might imagine at first glance. After so many years of wandering, Leo convinced himself that he liked the nomadic life and in a normal world, he would simply wither away like a plant left without water. Come here, Prince. Leo almost shouted. Come here, come here. Leo involuntarily wrinkled his nose. This boxer had broken every possible rule of life on the street, coming to deal with him in his own crosswalk. It was tantamount to a declaration of war, and what would he fight for? His street will be fatter. You can gut schoolboys, shake coins out of alcoholics, what about here? Standing around with a mug, baiting for change from the townspeople. Okay, Theo, back off, Leo demanded. This is my turf. See, I'm working. You're gonna scare away all my customers. Your territory. Theo was indignant. You work here. You threw me in front of a car, asshole. You made me scratch my side. I apologize, said the tramp. I didn't mean to really. Sorry. Theo's eyes went wide with anger. Here. A powerful left hook sent Leo crashing to the ground. A side effect of street life. He'd learned to fall so he'd take as little damage as possible. Like an expert stuntman, but the stars danced in front of his eyes. He felt dizzy, and the light seemed a little dimmer. Theo smirked and lifted his leg to consolidate his success, but his puny body was pinned against the wall. Cops, what the hell is this? Theo said indignantly as his arms were pulled down with a police collar. How dare you, huh? I'm in a free country. Read me my rights. Shut up, the cop replied and pinned the former boxer against the wall. He probably lost a good half of his teeth from those blows. I'll read you your license. Not on my street. Hey, man, you need some help? That question was addressed to Leo. He touched his injured cheek. It hurt, but it was bearable. Theo must have hit it half-heartedly. His teeth didn't even wobble. No, he couldn't go down to the station. First of all, the boxer could add to it in the car. 
too. The other guys would think he's a snitch. Theo's own fault, he got himself in trouble. Three, they'll be sure to make a report on him at the station. It's all right, Officer Leo replied getting up. I'm looking for a job. I've been begging recently, honestly. I haven't quite figured out what it's all about yet. A job? The cop asked incredulously. That's right, begging, you know, is not Christian. For your diligence and humility, you're entitled to a special prize. Here you go. He handed him a coupon for the lodging house. That's lucky. For the second day in a row, he could shower and sleep in a bed. The coupon came with a $10 trip to the municipal cafe. Of course, they'd cheat him out of his money and give him a glass of tea instead of a Coke. But it's better than eating a bun and pour it again. Thank you, officer, Leo bowed. I feel much better. Permission to go. But the cop was no longer paying any attention to him. He turned around and pushed Theo in front of him, and he was eager to turn around and say what he thought about law and order in this country. But the policeman had a firm grip on the detainee's shoulder, and he could only express his indignation with his back. Tucking the coupon into his pocket, Leo raised the mug in front of him. But because of the stupid bruise on his cheek, the stream of change had dried up, and so had his desire to collect it. Today, the townspeople were shying away from him, reluctant to throw coins. By 1 p.m., the vagrant had collected a little more than a dollar. Soon, however, a cafe would open where he could redeem the coupon. Then buy a bottle of port and get really drunk. The things Leo regretted weren't easy to count. He was about 40% regret himself, like whiskey made of alcohol. His father was stingy, even though he was literally sitting on money. His investment fund was considered one of the strongest on the West Coast. There was a minimum of servants in the huge house, and the table was bursting with treats only when there were guests. The rest of the days they ate not so much poorly, but not richly either. His father forbade Leo everything and demanded complete obedience. He, the only child in the family, felt like a black sheep in the company of his peers. While the other children of rich parents bought expensive toys, taken to the best resorts in the world, he was forced to listen to his father's admonitions. He paid only for the bare necessities, or he had taste. At some point, the parent decided that it was time for his son to stop moving the bag. Your first car, his father said, handing him the keys to a red Cadillac. You have to drive something to the school building, right? Leo was speechless at the sight of it. His father had many cars, a whole collection, but he rarely used them. Mom even drove a mass-produced Honda. Not a bad car, but clearly does not match the status of a millionaire's wife. Cadillac, against this background, looked like an alien from the planet of luxury. Dad, are you serious? Then asked Leo, not believing his happiness. Yes, but, and he immediately came up with a whole bunch of terms and conditions for using the cars. They were stupid, but on the plus side, Leo wasn't going to abide by them. He couldn't wait to drive his beauty up to campus and park it in the faculty parking lot. Hardly anyone would say a word to him. Contrary to his father's wishes, his son grew up to be a spender. He went to expensive clubs and restaurants, bought things in boutiques, and sometimes even just squandered money. All of his son's financial shenanigans were covered by his mom. She somehow wrote off his expenses, transferring them to his father's fund. Leo didn't want to go into details. All that mattered was that everything was nice and decent. How old was he then? 22, I think. The joy of owning a collector's Cadillac was short-lived. His parent passed away, and Leo discovered a terrible truth. It's been many years since the foundation, one of the strongest on the coast, went bankrupt. By some unknown inertia of luxury, the family had been living in debt all these years. Neither Leo nor his mother had noticed the telltale signs of financial insolvency all that time, though they might have. As soon as his father died, there was no one to fend off the attacks of creditors. The expensive collection of cars went up for auction, as did the luxurious house. All that survived was a red Cadillac, his mother's jewelry and some personal effects. And that, if not for the advice of a lawyer, they might have given the creditors even that. Leo sat down at a beggar's table away from the main hall. He can't go near the handouts. The police might be called. All that's left is to wait for an employee to take the coupon and ring it up. The morning breakfast was long forgotten, and Leo was starving. And thirsty. Finally, a cafe employee appeared near him, and the vagrant held out his coupon to him. So waiter, Leo began. He was in a good mood. I'll have an aperitif to start with. But the social worker didn't appreciate his joke. He took the tear-off coupon, threw the rest on the table and disappeared. 
For a long 20 minutes, the tramp waited until he was served his legitimate food. Finally, the cafeteria employee brought a pathetic cutlet, a small spoonful of mashed potatoes, bean soup, and a whole plate of bread. And that was for $10. What about the selection? Leo was indignant. Where are the vegetables? Where's the cheese? Eat what you're given, the employee said, or I'll call the cops. You'll go hungry, understand? The hobo sighed and started eating his lunch. The big advantage of mashed potatoes, cutlets, and bean soup is that you don't have to chew them. Along with the human form, the street takes away the teeth of its inhabitants. Even if you protect them like the apple of your eye during fights and police interrogations, diseases are bound to do their work. Leo chewed and thought that 10 years ago he would have just walked past a cafe like this. But today, he considered it a great fortune to dine there. Paul had gotten used to being hired for all sorts of nonsense. But even for him, this assignment was too much. It's one thing to find a cat or a dog. At least that's where his profession as a private investigator comes in. You call trapping services, drive around shelters, and try to compare a picture of the animal with the one you're offered to pick up. But following a stray? Yes, he has the proud distinction of being a retired police officer on his resume. He spent 20 years looking for criminals with mixed success, so he understood the ins and outs of the craft. But the initiated know that his resume should have been read between the lines. After all, Paul retired, but without a pension. It was the usual way for those who got knocked up. And he, being retired, had no pension and no obvious prospects. So he took on everything. Even such a ridiculous assignment as following the vagrant. He named his usual rate of $100 a day, and the client did not even flinch. At first glance, it seemed like a lot of money. But in fact, after all the deductions and taxes, after gasoline and dry cleaning, there was a pittance left to live on. And he didn't have a job every day. The client paid well. He made it a rule never to argue with customers, and it really worked. He made notes in his notebook during the conversation, but it was more for show. Paul's memory had not failed him so far, and he easily memorized all the information. To follow the strange guy in the drab coat, to find out as much information about his past as possible, but there was a hitch. The detective knew the homeless too well, and to get any information at all, you have to do a lot of work. Optimally, you have to become homeless himself. Paul used his own channels to confirm the name Leonard, and then, just in case, to get more information about the client. Her request seemed very strange, and the name too familiar. He should have turned Cindy down, if only because he'd been involved in the case in the past, but he needed the money too badly. He also wanted to get to the bottom of it. Paul reported his findings not only to his client, but also to Mark. At some point he even felt like he was back in the service. He longed for both the badge and the gun. In a few days of stalking the homeless man, he'd made some progress. For one thing, he got Chris to give him the note. She didn't even have to pay extra. She already knew him well enough to help him. Secondly, to realize that the tramp's heart was scratching. Paul couldn't believe that the same major had turned into the dregs of society. Fate is a villain. Alcohol must be to blame. At first, his client's assignment seemed nice to trace, to photograph, to plant a note, but her new assignment looked strange even for this series. Out of old habit, Paul only nodded and agreed. After all, he reserved the right to run the errand for himself. As soon as they said goodbye, the private detective immediately went to the phone booth and started looking for change. This attribute of the past had almost left the streets of their city. Why the booths when everyone has a great phone in his pocket? Only great individuals like him must have continued to use the booths. Hey, Mark Paul said, you sit down there and get a firm grip on the table. Even a dry guy like you might not be able to take it and break. When Luke was out the door, Mark took out a cigarette and lit it. He liked his tobacco the strongest, the kind that made you all chipper. The investigator felt he was wasting his time. Today was exactly 10 years since Kendi's body had been pulled from the cold water. This case had gone back and forth so many times that Mark had lost count. Now Cindy's gonna come to him again, only not so young, and play the old record. Understand, detective. She'd say five minutes later. She couldn't, she couldn't have committed suicide. The day before, she'd shared her plans with me. She was going to be picked up in the morning by that major. The one I've told you about a hundred times, but you're in no hurry to check my story. Mark nodded, but his heart was beginning to boil. An experienced policeman, he never argued with relatives of victims or injured parties. He tried not to interrupt. 
But Cindy was a special guest. She was testing his patience like no one else. He's gonna snap any minute now. Oh, come on. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. So many years have passed, and we still don't know if it was really murder. Even I'm not sure, you know. How are we going to convince a court of law? Cindy cried. What a stiff neck jerk. Of course, the woman has a tragedy. Her sister died falling off that cliff. Mark's already ruled ten times to dismiss the case. He's made a convincing case for why Kendi would do such a thing. He reported that he'd never been able to locate the big guy in the Red Jaguar. But there were still doubts in his heart. And some theories were still being tested. Here, Cindy said, holding out her cell phone. I recognize this car. Take a look. Without much hope, the investigator looked at the screen. Of course it's not a Jaguar, it's a Cadillac. Just one detail, but what an effect. The car, of course, is luxurious. Those toys that are now coming off the assembly line and in the footsteps of the cars of the 80s, they knew how to do it. We recently went to a retro exhibition with my husband, said the girl, wiping her tears. And there I saw this car. Of course, I could be wrong, but it looked very similar. Did you take a picture of the license plate? The investigator asked hopefully. The girl took her cell phone and started moving the pictures around. She took a good hundred pictures of the Cadillac. And only on one of them the license plate number could somehow be made out. Luck. Mark dumped the pictures onto his computer and transcribed the license plate number. Immediately he sent a message to the chat room to have the guys in information services prepare a full background on the car. He should have the file any minute now. Turns out he hadn't done everything. Every time Mark took the case, he had mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, it bored the hell out of him. On the other hand, he wanted to solve the mystery. It was probably because of the scandalous case that his career never got off the ground. It's been 10 years since he's been stuck in the district. Thank you, Mark said with a smile. I'll do my best. I'm sorry I snapped, miss. The girl was silent and wouldn't leave. She didn't like him, did she? Cindy had gone from redneck to strong and confident woman before his eyes. She seemed to be a designer and even a success. Every year she looked better and better, and the cars she drove to the station were more and more in line with the average person's idea of a successful life. That's not all. Cindy stretched out. I think I found him. Who? Mark was surprised. I think that girl decided to finish him off today. The killer answered the guest in a broken voice, but this time she didn't cry. The other extreme of life on the streets is immense boredom. Once the basic needs are met, the beggar has nothing else to do. And out of boredom, vagrants start doing all sorts of obscene things. They drink anything that burns. They start other people's cars. Climbing into open houses. After a heavy lunch, Leo was not even lazy and went to the bathroom to wash his hands properly and get all the crumbs out of his beard. He looked at himself in the mirror. Yes, it looked really scary. His black hair is tangled. His beard ages him 10 years and that's at least. Dirty clothes all at small and large holes. It seems like in his past life Leo washed his hands before eating, and he didn't have a beard at all. He didn't want to go to the crossing, and there was nothing to do. Beggars don't have hobbies, his failing eyesight and lack of habit don't even allow him to read books. Besides, when you immerse yourself in a story, you become too open-minded. Someone could steal your backpack or something. That leaves alcohol. The tramp counted the coin and small bills in his pocket. It was an impressive sum for which he could buy two or even three bottles of port. But he might not be allowed into the lodging if he took so much fuel into himself. Even for him the Castellan would not make a discount, so it was necessary to buy a bottle, go inside and drink it right in the bathroom. There was still plenty of time before the lodge opened, so Leo decided to just walk around town. So when his father died, he thought he was truly free. Bankruptcy didn't scare him at first, because he just didn't believe in it. His mother didn't survive the financial collapse and ended up in a community hospital. Leo initially visited her a few times in the first year, and what he saw made a lasting impression on him. We're fabulously rich, Leonard, she used to say when we met. See how big my house is? Only the servants won't give me my china for some reason. Can you tell them to put it up when you arrive? Some philanthropist has given an outdated mansion to a hospital, and mother feels like she owns the place and the doctors and staff are personal servants. Mother even tried to keep track of expenses, like in her own home. She didn't rampage at all, so her antics were treated with humor rather than anger. Everyone was amused except Leo, so he found it best not to show up at the hospital. 
His father had died just in time. Leo was finishing college and preparing for a career in finance. He was not going to become a clerk in someone else's fund and slowly, step by step, rise to the top of the stock market. Leo sold his luxurious Cadillac to some collector for a substantial sum of money. Not only because he needed the money, but also to forget about her. After all, Candy's eyes sometimes appeared in his mind's eye. Leo started his own foundation, trying to make a splash in everyone's eyes. Like his father, he was trying to build a financial soap castle. He must have succeeded if it hadn't been for his parents' collapse. But his last name became a curse, not a mantra of success. When the partners heard it, they were slow to hand over huge sums of money. And the stock market is a conveyor belt. The abilities, which were so often talked about by teachers at the university, for some reason did not bear fruit. Lack of experience undermined the budding financier. And gradually Leo lost everything, including his dignity. The fund went bust, but it took him only a few months, not decades like his father. Now walking down the street in his rags, Leo doubted the reality of the past at all. Had it really happened to him? Or had he dreamed it in the same cellars and lodgings where he suffered after cheap wine? After experiencing a second collapse, Leo fell into despair. A regular job was out of the question. Perhaps at the beginning, he could have gotten a job at a bank, become a paralegal or a salesman in a salon, but he didn't want a handout. He wanted to be at the top of the pyramid, not at the bottom. After the failed fund, he borrowed a lot of money from friends from his past life. Anyone who could give him any decent amount of money claimed he was about to inherit. Leo was still very persuasive back then. They believed him, and he didn't skimp on future interest. Having collected a substantial sum, the young man began to think about where to invest it. And this time for some reason, he decided to play in the casino. His impeccable education instilled in him the false idea that playing the system will definitely bring a big score. If the agony of the fun lasted for several months, then the effort in the casino only a couple of days. Going out on the street without a penny in his pocket, Leo realized that now no one would ever trust him with a bill larger than $20. There was only one way to the bottom, to the bottom of the pyramid, which he was so eager to conquer. Next came a trial and 12 months in prison. He was even released a few days early for good behavior. Life in the statehouse finally managed to reconcile him with reality. He will never rise to the top, never become a goldfish or at least a jellyfish. He's left to wander on the bottom. Years passed. Leo attributed his financial failures to karma. He didn't know the universe, he owed it a huge debt. If the first month on the street you are still making plans, dreaming of returning to normal life, then a year later it is no longer possible. The smell of sweat ceases to bother you, and leftovers from the supermarket tank seem not the worst option for breakfast and dinner. Over the years, he's realized that his fall to rock bottom started with that very trip, and the crime he committed. To forget, he had to drink wine. His feet carried him to a cheap store where, even with his paltry sum, Leo could feel like a king. But suddenly he froze, hesitating, afraid to cross the street. On the corner stood she, and seemed to be looking in his direction. She looked left and right, and started to cross the street. Leo wanted to run, but his legs wouldn't obey him. Mark had no illusions about going to the rich estate. It seemed to him that he was wasting his time, and that the rich people were just mocking him and his old fort. Surprisingly, the person on the other end of the line did not refuse to look at the Cadillac, but asked him to drive across the street for the servants. He also promised not to report anything to the newspapers, although the investigator did not even think about it. The servants rode. Mark resented it as he drove down the highway. Then he had to turn onto a narrow asphalt road with trees overhanging it. A huge estate opened up before him. The owner definitely had taste, because the house was perfect no matter which way you looked at it. Drive through, the guard waved his hand, looking at the documents. They're waiting. Over there. He could use a map to get around the estate. Mark drove up to the huge building and almost physically felt his own squalor. What he thought was a gymnasium turned out to be a giant garage. Waiting for him outside the building was a real butler. Despite the hot weather, the man wore a white shirt with some strange ruffles and a black jacket. Good afternoon, nodded the butler. We are pleased to welcome you to Mr. White's manor. He has readily responded to assist in the investigation. Mr. White was unable to receive you himself and asked me to convey his deepest apologies. The fact is that a gentleman from the government is visiting him today. If necessary, I can invite them both. 
No need, Mark replied. He tried to hold himself loosely, but he clearly lacked the necessary manners. This is, you know, an unofficial visit. I'm investigating a very old case. Oh, don't get me started on the details. The man asked and opened the door. They entered a glass room. Let me show you the whole collection. And you can choose the car that is of interest to you. We are ready to provide it for inspection at any time of the day or night. But we can't seize it. There's hardly a judge in the county who'll sign a warrant. Come on in, but don't forget to wear booties. Mark walked into the garage and literally couldn't believe his eyes. It was as if a wizard had enlarged his son's cars and arranged them in perfect order. What was there? Expensive Ferrari, Jaguar, Mercedes, Aston Martin. Mark walked across the perfectly white tile floor. In the garage, he saw three engineers in white coats examining a vintage American, the make of which he couldn't name and marking something on their clipboards. Yes, that's it. The investigator nodded at the red car. The butler kept pace with him. Mr. White doesn't just collect cars, the butler said. He also shows them off to the world. If a car has a criminal history, we can help unravel it. I don't think the Cadillac is guilty of anything, the investigator shrugged. He opened the door to the cabin, peered inside. Surprisingly, the butler didn't ask for gloves, but was wiping everything down with a napkin. I looked in the trunk. So many years had passed. What had he hoped for, Billy? The car looked sturdily clean, like it had just come off the assembly line. The specialty of this model is the interior, the butler said. It's a one-of-a-kind car. Pay attention to the inner trim of the air duct, steering wheel, gearbox overlay. Only 100 examples of this saloon ever rolled off the assembly line. As you understand, only a few have reached our days. Do you remember who drove it before? The investigator clarified. In fact, he knew the answer to this question. Of course, I myself purchased this stunning specimen. The car was in terrible condition, Butler said. It was obvious it had been used as an everyday car. That's not acceptable when you're talking about collector's virgins. But most surprisingly, a suitcase was found in the trunk. The previous owner was so absent-minded that he even forgot to take it out. I doubt he even looked in the trunk. That's interesting, said the investigator. Can you describe it? I'm talking about the suitcase. Come on, I'll show you, the man shrugged. I could throw it away. But you know, such things should be handled with care. Mark and the butler went into a room in the garage. The whole wall was taken up by drawers like store lockers. The man took out a huge magazine, checked some records and approached the box. He opened it with a universal key he pulled out of his jacket. No way, Mark exhaled, taking the suitcase. Fantastic. Hallucinations are a sure sign of a mental disorder caused by alcohol intake, but they can visit a person not only during heavy drinking. It is enough not to drink for a few days, and here you begin to see something that in reality does not exist. To stop the trembling in his hands, Leo begged a glass of instant coffee from the Help for Everyone tent. The taste was disgusting, but the caffeine was doing its job. Leo had one question. Had he really pushed that girl off the cliff? I think he'd seen an obituary in the local paper, but he wasn't sure anymore. No one had ever questioned him about that day, never asked him if he'd gone to the lakeside, never charged him or detained him. What if she didn't really exist? The same questions could be addressed to himself. There was a psychologist on duty at the Help for Everyone tent. That was exactly the kind of specialist the vagrant lacked. It was strange, of course, in his position to ask such questions, but, there was no cue of those who wanted to talk to the specialist anyway. Hello, said Leo. If I may, I'd like to make an appeal. I've been plagued by intrusive images lately. They keep appearing in my head. Yes, of course, the woman nodded. Call me Al. I'm always at your service. We've gotten a hundred of your co-workers back to normal. That's exactly what she said, co-workers. As if vagrancy wasn't a state of mind, but a profession or a disease that can be cured. Leo was indignant but he decided not to show that he was boiling inside. Maybe this woman would really give him some good advice. I have a simple question, but you must understand, said the tramp. Let's say I can't get over a girl. She comes to me everywhere. This is the third time I've seen her. In others, you know? Yes, the psychologist nodded. What was her name? I don't know, Leo lied. How long did you two know each other? I don't know. Does that bother you? What's the problem that I can help you with? Leo was silent, but not because he had nothing to say, he was just afraid. 
Yes, he didn't know if Kendi really existed, though he didn't want to say her name. The problem was something else. He didn't realize if he really existed. Are the other beggars calling him Prince because he went to an expensive college and was once a financier? Or were they just mocking him? Did his past really exist? Or did he make it up, like a writer composing an adventure story? All these thoughts must have come from the lack of booze. It was the third day he'd been sober. If he made it all up, if Leonardo never existed and was only a beggar Leo, then his girlfriend did not exist. From these thoughts became quite bad. The beggar thanked the psychologist and smiled, but the woman only wrinkled her nose. He must look terrible. There was only one way left to confirm his own realism. Leo went to the other side of town. He stood in a giant line at a barber shop for beggars like himself. Two specialists in medical masks were cutting and shaving a huge crowd of people. The odors of the place could make an inexperienced person faint. When the procedure was over, Leo went to the mirror and took out a photograph. He always kept it close to his heart, as a reminder of the old days. It showed a young man in an expensive suit and yellow tie, smiling at 32. The smile wasn't real. I picked up the photo to compare it to myself. Eyes, nose, chin and forehead all matched. It's really him. So in the past, Leo really was a financier and the son of a bankrupt millionaire. My legs started to ache from the long walk and standing. Urgent, urgent rest. The beggar began to rummage through his pockets to find a coupon for a night's lodging. Lost it. He took off his backpack, old and greasy, began to inspect all the compartments. Then the ridiculous coat he wore in almost all weathers. Jeans. The damn coupon was nowhere to be found. And he was counting on a bed, a disposable toothbrush, and a sandwich. Finally, the coupon turned up crumpled at the very bottom of his jeans pocket. Leo exhaled with relief. On the way to the lodge, Leo pondered. Everything that had happened to him was not a fantasy or a play of imagination. It gave him hope. On the other hand, he had killed that girl. He killed her, but he'd gotten away with it. It made my soul ache again. It's nice to know that you're healthy, that you're not crazy, and bitter to realize you're a murderer. Six o'clock at night. The bed and breakfast is just about to open and the best place is available. Leo chose a bunk at the very end of the room, on the first tier, put his things on it. This time the Castellan gave out a toothbrush and a sandwich in a clear bag. The beggar looked at it, no foreign papers. So that other co-workers wouldn't encroach on his place, he left the backpack behind. Anyway, there was nothing there that could be of interest to the inhabitants of the lodging house, and they usually steal at night. For a few cents in the basement, he could wash his clothes, and Leo decided to take advantage of the opportunity. Then he washed and cleaned himself up. After the barber shop, he looked almost like a normal person. That night, after a third day without alcohol, he slept surprisingly well. As always, he dreamed about bits and pieces of his past life, his parents' luxurious house, college, going out to restaurants. He felt great in the morning and thought he could really get back to normal, look for a job, a temporary place to live. Leo opened his backpack to put a brush and a baggie in there. Disposable or not, you decide for yourself. This one could really be used more than once. My hand came across something that shouldn't be in the backpack. Leo took out an envelope, opened it and got cold. Mark wanted to push the gas pedal to the floor, but held back. You have to be careful. Ten years to pass one day or even a month will not solve anything in his investigation. That's why he had to keep a cool head. Now he would go to the station, scrutinize the suitcase in front of Cindy, of course. He's already got her on the phone, and then he'll decide what to do. He had a secret too. Many years ago, he found the very major Cindy was sure existed. His name was Leonard Farger, a small-time crook, son of a victim of financial fraud. Mention of him lived only in the operational file, to which only he and the operatives had access. And the inspectors, but they rarely held such papers in their hands. True, no charges had been brought against him ten years ago. Yeah, he and Kendi were seen together. She was selling flowers at some rich guy's bar, so they could have met there. Theoretically, Leonard could have killed her. But why would he? In that dramatic year he lost his father, his fortune, then tried to make money, but in the end he lost even more money and even went to prison. They even put an experienced agent in his cell, but Leonard kept quiet. He was angry at the whole world, but not because of the girl's death, but because of his own bankruptcy. 
Then the tiny time limit came to an end, and traces of the major were lost. When Cindy showed him the trance picture, Mark had mixed feelings. He was both amused and sad at the same time. She had found the major after all these years. But Paul had already told her about it, in great secrecy, because a private investigator should not share the results of his research with anyone. Leo was apparently down and out, so he disappeared from the investigator's radar. But the photograph of the car in which he could give his victim a ride changed everything, as well as the suitcase, which inexplicably why kept the courteous butler of the exemplary billionaire. It can't be, cried Cindy, going through the clothes and shoes. These are all hers. I gave this shirt to her myself. It was clear that Candy was not living on a budget, the bare minimum, and they were all cheap. Two pairs of jeans, one dress, tights, some underwear, and a toothbrush. Even the suitcase was penniless. It didn't have a proper lock. If they had found the car and the things in it ten years ago, it would have been possible to conduct expert examinations. But now, years later, no traces could have been preserved. Let's sign the inspection report. Here and here. I'll keep investigating, Mark promised. But Cindy didn't want to leave. Mark specialized in cold cases. His department had a more poetic and sinister name for cases that coffins didn't want to investigate. That's right. Such cases can bury any career, even the most dedicated and careful investigator. In the early days of his career, nothing was going to go wrong, and he saw the county job as just a small stepping stone to a future career. His name is Leonard Farberg, Mark Side, a unique man who went from rich boy to pauper. You mean you knew who he was? Cindy was indignant, and you kept quiet? Understand, there's a mystery to the investigation, said Mark. I'm more surprised how you found him on the street in the first place. I don't think he's changed at all, Cindy shrugged. Kindy told me about him. You have to realize there's no direct evidence, the investigator said, although he won't be able to hire an expensive lawyer anymore. If we press charges, anyone will be willing to work with him. Because such evidence is a sure acquittal, we need concrete evidence. Witness, but we can vast the entire side. No one saw this guy there, or his confession. But if he's been silent for so many years, why should he talk? Cindy smiled. He must have been the only one with secrets. She was certainly a prominent girl, and her sister, judging by the pictures, was a beauty. Mark always felt remorse when he had to investigate the deaths of young girls, as if he was responsible for what happened. Do something for me, she asked and lowered her eyes, something special. Mark blushed. In his years with Cindy, you should have known she liked him as a man, but this was completely unacceptable to him. After all, he had a wife at home, even if they hadn't been getting along lately, and the children. But just as the investigator opened his mouth to express outrage, Cindy continued, Go there. To that cliff. That little boy will tell you all about it. Only you. Cause you know the whole story. Wait a minute, Mark said. He already knew what she was getting at, but he decided to look surprised. Only in the movies do criminals return to the scene of the crime. How are we going to get him there? On what grounds? She told him her plan, and Mark grinned. That's a good one. For some reason, amateurs think they can investigate cases as they please. It must be time to file this case away for good. Let Cindy complain. Do it for me, the girl asked. It's been 10 years since I've had a real life. All right, the investigator said in surprise. I'm in. For such tricks, Paul could well be disbarred. And then the only way out was to become a bouncer in some club. He avoided that fate as best he could. At first glance, being a security guard seems easy. In reality, you have to stand around all night long. And if you're not in good health, it's not easy. And a bouncer can always get punched in the face by angry customers, so you have to keep in shape. No, that's not what Paul will do. He's going to do the bidding of a strange client who's been watching too many soap operas. Two days ago, he'd already put $10 in that tramp's hand while he was passed out in the crosswalk. It was his own fault. He shouldn't have hit on a man who was just going to get coffee. But that time Paul was like bringing a stranger to his senses, it was acceptable. Today, the task was more difficult. Slip him that envelope without him noticing. The private detective nodded to Chris and went into the big room. He had dressed in old clothes especially for following the vagrant. Basically, he could pass for one of these unfortunates. Pretending to choose a more comfortable bunk, Paul began to look for Leonard with his eyes. He wasn't there. His backpack was on one of the beds. Definitely his. 
There was a small emblem of the Red Cross on the front. They must have given him the item as humanitarian aid. He walked over to the backpack and looked around. No one. He took out an envelope, opened the zipper. Hey, you. Someone called out to him. Paul didn't turn around. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. The detective heard footsteps approaching him. One of the lodgers, destitute, dirty, angry. He looked at Paul with distrust. What are you doing here? Same as you, the private detective muttered. Weren't you trying to cut off my purse? The guest asked. I can see you poking around. Why is it yours? Paul asked. No. That's good, said the detective, because I lost one just like it the other day, with the same cross on it. No man, it's not yours, the lodger said and smiled. It's Prince's purse. He's had it for a year, no less. All right, Paul grumbled, but I'll have a word with him. He's a bit of a tattletale. Hey, where's your stuff? You want to trade? The detective nodded vaguely toward the hallway. This talkative drifter was starting to get on his nerves. Did he think he was going to spend the night? Well, cheers, Paul said. I'm going for a smoke. The beggar gave him a surprised look. He had cigarettes, and he didn't even offer them. This one must be a new one. He still looks quite decent. There are only a couple of holes in his t-shirt, and his sneakers are intact. Maybe his wife kicked him out of the house. The next day, Leo saw her again from a distance. She was looking at the clothes behind the window with the most interested look. It was her, and she looked like she was continuing to age with him though she shouldn't have. But the vagabond wasn't as surprised now as he had been the day before. Coincidences like that just don't happen. There was an envelope in his backpack, and inside it was $20 and a one-way ticket. Lake sighed. From that day on, Leo never visited that place again. At first, he was just afraid to go there, and then apparently, he didn't have enough money. Today, however, he woke up with hope. Since he hadn't seen a body, maybe Kanye wasn't dead. Maybe she lost her memory or had no claim on him. Leo stepped out of the lodge and approached the window behind which the mirror stood. After three days without alcohol, a haircut from the social barber and laundry at the lodge, he looked almost normal. They definitely let him on the bus like this, which meant a trip to Lakeside. Why not? If she survived, that explained everything. That's the reason he's seen her the last couple days. But Leo didn't dare approach her. It wasn't far to the train station, and on the way he visited the canteen to get a proper meal. It wasn't a long journey, and he had $20, a fortune at his present time. He wanted to drink coffee again, once any morning started with this invigorating beverage. After breakfast Leo found his bus, handed the driver his ticket and took a seat. Over the past few years he had grown accustomed to rudeness and was worried about whether he would be allowed on the bus. But after a haircut and a wash, the track didn't look as bad as usual. The driver didn't say a word, just took the ticket and tore it up. You can choose a seat. Leo sat down by the window and put his backpack next to him so that no one would keep him company. In his years of loneliness, he had completely forgotten how to talk to people. Only his work phrases about how hungry he was, how tired and cold he was, and that he needed a few coins. Beggars don't have friends on the street. There are, of course, exceptions to the rules, but the alleged mutual aid of the homeless is simply a myth. It was a long ride, and Leo dozed off. He had already forgotten that blissful feeling of sleeping on a bus while traveling. Very few people went inside with him. Lakeside was usually visited in the afternoon or evening. The place had long ago become a musty on tourist itineraries. As crazy as the plan was, it worked. The guy got on the bus. What's more, he went straight to the train station. Paul couldn't understand the man's logic. And then there was Mark's indecision. Maybe if they had questioned him properly years ago, he would have confessed to everything. Hello, Mark. He sat down, the detective dialed a number from his notebook. Excuse me? There was a woman's voice on the other end. Paul hung up. Oh shit. Good thing I called from a payphone. I've got to get the investigator and the client mixed up. It'll be a scandal if the truth comes out. Okay, don't panic. We need to stick to the plan. Mark, are you there? The detective dialed another number. Yes, the investigator answered. He's on his way, Paul said. I don't know if he's gonna make it. He just got on a bus. Silence. With these phone booths, you never know when you're going to lose the connection. The detective bangs the phone against the wall a few times. Maybe it helped, because he heard the familiar voice again. I'm here, Mark answered. 
I don't like this whole thing. Wait, Paul continued. I accidentally dialed this one. What's her name? Cynthia. And I called your name, Mark. Cindy? The investigator was surprised. Did you talk to her? No, but she might have recognized my voice. Deny everything, Mark replied. You realize we both could get hurt. Paul walked toward the office. The case with this tramp was probably solved. Let the lady settle up with his assistant. He's not going to talk to her anymore. I can't believe he's doing this kind of nonsense. I wonder why it worked. And he'll go back to his unfaithful husbands and wives, kittens and dogs. Less pay, but no risks. Leo dreamed about the trial. He'd already been through that shame a few years before. All the newspapers had trumpeted that the son of a famous financier had followed in his father's footsteps. But he did it so ridiculously that he made the honorable public laugh, not with annoyance. He ran up debts, but he didn't even pretend to be in business. Just lost everything in the amusement arcades to end up in the dock. Leo memorized by heart the most caustic article about himself and his father. Risk-taking and fraud are twin brothers. Leonard seemed like a great guy. Friends, girls, expensive suits. No one could even imagine that this good-looking guy, whose first startup went bust, wouldn't even look for cryptic wording. He was simply borrowing money against a profitable business, promising 20% annual interest. On the scale of the world economy, the amount Leo took possession of was not so large, and not all of his creditors went to the police, who wants to look like a fool. If it were not for the sound name of Leonard, this case would have drowned in the hundreds of other similar cases and passed unnoticed. He didn't even have money for a lawyer, so the court appointed some old guy. He didn't understand anything about the stock market or investments, so he slept through the whole process. Only once in a while he woke up and inserted some remark not always in the right place. Leo was lucky. Thanks to his full confession of guilt, the judge showed unprecedented humanity and imposed a symbolic punishment. The tramp woke up, glad that it was only a dream, that he didn't have to go through the shame once again. Yes, if he was tried for the murder of a pregnant woman, he could hardly expect mercy. He'd probably spend the rest of his days behind bars. There was nothing wrong with prison, by and large. There was certainly more order there than on the street. But Leo decided to himself that he would never go back behind bars again. And in his years of wandering he had never once been to a police station, although he could get arrested for vagrancy. The secret is simple. Never stay in one place for too long. Keep moving. After three hours on the road, the bus finally arrived at the terminus. It was almost lunchtime. It was as if Leo had gotten a second wind. After so many years outdoors, his arms and legs usually ached, his knees and spine were aching. But today, he felt surprisingly good. So he decided to climb to the top point on the very cliff where his fall to the bottom began. The place has changed and become more cultured over the years. A secure fence has been installed along the entire hiking trail. It must have something to do with Candy and her untimely passing. Down at the bottom of the hill, there were souvenir shops and a few calves. Lito wanted to finish his business as soon as possible, but he was in no hurry. He went into a cafe, ordered a coffee and a hot dog. He drank the drink with pleasure. It was amazing how people's attitudes toward him changed when he cleaned up a bit. No one kicked him out or threatened to call the police, and the sales girl even smiled. Once upon a time, when he wore expensive suits and ties, he would have definitely taken advantage of that smile, but not today. There were only a few cars parked in the huge parking lot. There must not be much of a crowd here on a weekday. The weather is beautiful, just like it was then, years ago. The fence made it easier to walk, and Leo was quickly at the very top. He walked to the edge. Hello. He heard a voice and turned around sharply. The tramp almost slipped from surprise, but grabbed the fence with his hand. I apologize for scaring him. In front of him stood a man dressed like a typical detective. Hat, gray coat, white shirt, though it was a fairly warm day. Shoes instead of comfortable sneakers. I wonder how he climbed that mountain in them. Even if he didn't utter a word, his affiliation with the police would be immediately clear. Good afternoon, Leo replied. To what do I owe the honor? My name is Mark. I'm investigating the case, the man replied. It seems you're the one I've been waiting for the last few years. Would you like to tell me something? Yes, Leo sighed. I do. And it was pure truth. It must be that if he had met the detective even a year earlier, he would have denied everything. But that didn't make any sense today. Leo was just tired of moving from place to place and also from the eyes he saw in front of him. 
but realizing all of that was only possible here. I mean, I'm sorry, the drifter shrugged. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. Ever since her sister's death, it was as if Cindy had lost the best part of herself. She didn't believe in suicide for a second. And when the pathologist told her about the pregnancy, Cindy was ready to tear down walls. Of course, he was the golden boy who threw her off the cliff. And even back then, years ago, she realized why. Cindy felt sorry for herself for not demanding that her sister stop hanging out with the major. She felt that this guy would bring her no joy. But the police didn't seem to agree with her reasoning. Such a complicated case was entrusted to the dumbest investigator on the coast. He never found the red car that the major used to drive Candy to the vacant lot. Didn't even find him, though there weren't many children of rich parents in the neighborhood. He dropped the case a dozen times and started over after she complained to the top. At some point she just accepted that it would be Mark who would investigate the case and decided to cooperate with him. She turned to private detectives. Fortune tellers approached expensive restaurants and cafes where this major could be. Only after four years, she finally learned his name and was able to get a photo. Turns out, he stopped being a major right after her sister was murdered. If that's a punishment, it's a very weak one. Cindy tried to get her life back on track. She graduated college, became a designer, got married, even had a baby. But she still had an emptiness inside her, a hole in the place of the part of her soul that had filled candies. And so she went back to the station again and again, talking to the investigator and trying to convince him that she was right. He never argued with her, willingly listened to her, and for the first time he snapped only recently. At the same time she was looking for the major herself, but he seemed to have fallen through the ground. He'd been in jail for some financial thing, and then he disappeared. Mark, that tight investigator, convinced her there was no evidence anyway, and he didn't seem intent on bringing the case to trial. Until one day she accidentally found Leonard herself. There was a new beggar in the passageway she went down every day. Like a true artist, she was always looking at people. Maybe she'd see something in their profile, sketch them, and though she'd never seen Leo, the murderous major, in person, he'd given himself away. The way he looked at her, like he was seeing a ghost. Cindy had to hire a detective to follow the drifter, get his name, and take his picture. Cindy couldn't believe her eyes. Leo had sunk so low that he had definitely hit bottom. Only her eye of a seasoned artist could recognize in the beggar the golden boy who had driven Kendi around and probably sent her to the other side of the world. When Cindy hired a private investigator, he too made surprised eyes. But he knew his job, and within a couple days, he confirmed her hunch. The overweight retired man didn't know what she was interested in. But he didn't ask any questions, after all, she was paying money. He had somehow managed to slip the note and put the envelope with the money and the ticket in his backpack. For some reason, Cindy was sure Leonard wouldn't stand for it and drive to the lakeside. And there he weed a policeman and then, out of surprise, tell him everything. All she had to do was be patient and wait, so that after all these years, justice would be served and retribution would find its villain. And if it hadn't been for that phone call today, she would have kept waiting. She could have sworn it was a private detective talking to her and I think he gave her the name of an investigator. Did they really know each other? Or had Mark come out to him himself after her strange request? Mark had taken up position on the hill earlier in the morning. The bus ticket Cindy was talking about didn't have a departure time only a date, so the drifter and part-time ex-major could arrive at any moment. Of course, the plan seemed fantastic to him. Not only did Leonard have to show up today, he had to want to open up to him, tell him everything that was on his mind, even talking to Paul wasn't reassuring. Let's say Leonard got on the bus, but what's stopping him from getting off? He could change his mind by the time he got to Lakeside, or make surprised eyes when he asked a question, or even get angry and pick a fight. Well, that's unlikely. Beggars don't usually show aggression. Gathering for this strange task, the investigator for some reason did not think about the fact that he would have to wait for the tramp to appear in the blazing sun. His hat offered little protection, and his shirt was quickly soaked with They never looked for me, Leonard replied. No one asked questions. I wasn't hiding from anyone. I waited for them to come for me, even made up an alibi for myself. But you never came. And that waiting was eating me up inside. Well, the investigator smiled. So I came. Better late than never. Yes, nodded the tramp. Even after the confession, he was not relieved. Rather, he was filled with fear. Now the newspapers would be sure to go after him with renewed vigor. 
if they remembered, of course. Over the years, his name may well have been forgotten for the social media. Although, if we're talking about solving a murder from 10 years ago, the case is solved, Mark said. I think the court will take your remorse into account. Come on, son. What's next? Leo asked. He didn't move, but clung to the fence as if he were dizzy. The usual, sighed the investigator and took out a cigarette. Precinct. Protocol. You'll have to write a confession so the court won't take it out on you. I'll put in a good word with the prosecutor so he'll be loyal. And then, the beggar asked. I don't know, admitted the investigator. Prison, I guess. Hunger came back again. Mark thought it would be a good idea to go to a cafe and get something to eat. After all, this hobo turned major was almost like a relative to him. He knew almost everything about him. Prison? Ron Leo said, swam over the fence and took a step forward off the cliff and flew into the void. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.